Hello, my name is Chris Horton, and this is George. And you're watching Kidlit TV. Susie Jaramillo, the creator of Canticos, and this is my friend Renee, and she plays the guitar. Hi. It's my favorite time of year. It's the holidays. I'm from Venezuela. Can everyone say Venezuela? Venezuela. Very cool. So I'm from Venezuela, and in Venezuela, our favorite song of the year, come the holiday time, is Mi Burrito Sabanero, My Little Donkey. And it follows the journey of this little donkey on his way to Bethlehem for his very first Christmas. Should we read it together? Yeah? Let's see. Here we go. Here's the donkey, and he's being ridden by a little chicky. And the chicky says, With my little donkey, I go walking all the way to Bethlehem. See me go, see me go. On to Bethlehem I go. And on the way to Bethlehem, he meets all these little animals. They all are bringing a present. And what's the best present you can ever give? It's love, right? So each one of these little animals is bringing love as a present. They're bringing their hearts. So our path is lit so very far by the bright and shiny star. And we see kings on their way as well. See me go, see me go, on to Bethlehem I go. With my ukulele, I go singing while my donkey goes a-springing. See how, he, see how the chickie plays the cuatro? The ukulele? Kind of like she plays the guitar, yeah. The chickie plays the cuatro, the ukulele. See me go, see me go, on to Bethlehem I go. Okay, everybody, now comes the fun part. You ready? Tuki, 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 tuki. Tuki, 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 ta. Look at all these fun animals that are inside the windows in Bethlehem. Hurry, hurry, little donkey, because you know we're almost there. Tuki, 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 tuki. Tuki, 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 tu. Hurry, hurry, little donkey. Jesus waits for me and you. And now we're gonna do it in Espanol. Is everybody ready to hear it in Espanol? Here it goes. Con mi burrito sabanero voy camino a Belén. Si me ven, si me ven, voy camino a Belén. El lucerito mañanero ilumina mi sendero. And look, here are the reyes, the reyes magos in Spanish. That's how you say the three kings. Con mi cuatrico, that's how you say ukulele in Spanish. Con mi cuatrico voy cantando, mi burrito va trotando. Si me ven, si me ven, voy camino a Belén. Ready for the fun part? Tuki, 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 tuki. Tuki, 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 ta. Apurate mi burrito, que ya vamos a llegar. Tuki, 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 tuki. Tuki, 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 tu. Apurate mi burrito, vamos a ver a Jesús. And now comes the fun part. Because everybody knows this is a song, right? Did you know the song? All right, so here's the tricky thing. We're gonna sing this song in English and in Spanish at the same time. Yeah, kind of hard, huh? Everybody ready? With my little donkey I go walking all the way to Bethlehem Con mi burrito sabanero voy camino a Belén Si me go, si me go, on to Bethlehem I go Si me ven, si me ven, voy camino a Belén Our path is lit so very far by the bright and shining star El lucerito My ukulele, I go singing while my donkey goes 
Vamos a springing con mi cuatrito voy cantando mi burrito va cantando si me go si me go on to Bethlehem I go si me ven si me ven voy camino a Belén tuki 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 ta apúrate mi burrito que ya vamos a llegar tuki 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 tu, apúrate mi burrito, vamos a ver a Jesús. Tuki 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 tuki, tuki 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 tu, hurry hurry little donkey, 'cause you know we're almost there. Tuki 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 tuki, tuki 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 tu, hurry hurry little donkey, Jesus wait for me and you. If you want to see this song and many, many, many others, please come visit us on canticosworld.com. Thank you so much for coming to Kidlit TV. We'll see you next time. Mwah, mwah. Bye bye. Hi, I'm Rocco Steno, and welcome to Storymakers. Today we're doing a remote Storymakers with Yehudi Mercado, all the way out in California. Welcome to Storymakers. Thanks, thanks for having me, Rocco. It's great to be here. And we're going to be talking about your book, Fun, Fun, Fun World. Yes, it looks, flipping through it, it looks like a lot of fun. It is a very colorful book. You want to tell? Tell us a little bit about it. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, you know, I've always been obsessed with theme parks as a kid. Uh, there was a theme park in Houston, Texas, where I grew up called Astro World, And so I always loved the idea of like space and theme parks. So Fun, Fun, Fun World is about a group of uh, sort of goofy space invaders. They're assigned to take over planets for, you know, a whole empire, but they're the worst space invaders in the galaxy. So they're on their last mission where they have to conquer a planet and the captain promises the queen that I'm going to conquer Earth for you. And of course, Earth is the most, you know, it's the hardest planet to conquer. Uh, but he's brash and he says he insists that he'll conquer Earth. So they go to Earth, they conquer it, but they don't realize what they've conquered was a, an amusement park. So it's a, like a derelict amusement park that... Uh, a son and his father are helping to rebuild. So when you say a derelict amusement park, meaning that it's a not in operation? That's right, it's seen better days. Fun 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 World has seen better days. Javi and his uh, father, Gachi, uh, are the only two workers trying to renovate this theme park. They're thinking they're invading Earth, but they're actually invading a theme park. So they think, oh, it's the castle, then, you know, then that's the capital of Earth. So they take over the castle, so. All the equivalents that they, they think they've conquered are in the theme park. They don't realize it's just rides or, you know, just concession stands. Right. And your main character's name again is? His name is Captain Minky. So tell me a little bit about Captain Minky. Well, Captain Minky, he's, uh, he's a lovable goofball. Uh, he's not the brightest bulb in the galaxy, um, but he's, he's brash and he's brave and he gets extremely lucky all the time, which is very helpful for if you're a a space invading captain. I like to think of him a little bit like Captain Kirk from Star Trek, but not as bright, but just as daring. That's a very good description. You know, Captain Kirk from Star Trek, not as bright, but just as daring. I'd like that description. So uh, Minky, his mother was a, you know, a famous world conqueror. So he has, to, he has a lot to live up to. So he's kind of living in the shadow of his mother. And she was a great space warrior. Aren't we all, right? <laughs> you know, I bet our viewers would love to learn to draw Captain Minky. Can you show us how? Yeah, I'd love to. So I work digitally. So I use a, a, an iPad and an Apple Pencil. And I like to start with a big giant head. Because Minky's got a big head and he thinks a lot of himself. 
And then he's got sort of like these dark circles under his eyes. He doesn't sleep much. Then he's got these four kind of hair spikes, They're kind of horns, hair spikes. And he's got this thin little body. He wears a cool jacket, though. I do like his jacket. I wish I had a jacket like Minky. He's got three fingers on each hand. Then he's got these cool boots. I don't look good in boots. I wish I looked good in boots. And then he's got a sort of noodly, sort of kidney bean shaped mouth. And then his teeth are kind of like the shape of uh, tombstones. And he's got little bitty beady eyes. And they're always wide open because he's always optimistic. And there you go. That's Minky. Yeah, I got more muscles than that. Okay, Minky, I'll draw you with more muscles. How about big muscles like that? You're kind of bursting out of your jacket there. Yeah, yeah. How about that? That's better. My pleasure, Minky. So, is Minky based on you? Uh, no, actually, um, uh, the kid, uh, Javi, that works at the park with his father, that's very much based on me. So even like the physical look of him versus my father, like me to my father look exactly like Javi Takachi. Like that's how I looked as a kid. Uh, and I always wear the sort of like hoodies and uh, uh, and Javi is like, he's smart uh, and he, you know, he believes in magic. He believes in aliens and ghosts. Uh, and that's very much, you know, sort of based on, uh, you know, my sort of fantastical thinking. But yeah, my father, you know, growing up, my father uh, it, it was an architect. So I'd like to think of like, oh, you know, in another life, we could build a theme park together someday. That's a fascinating painting behind you. Is there a story connected to that? Yeah, it was uh, painted by my father. He's a painter and an architect. And uh, growing up, he was responsible for taking me to art supply stores every weekend. And I got to buy markers and pads and papers. So very much my inspiration for drawing growing up. Yes, there is so much happening on every page of this book. So what was the most uh, challenging part of the book for you? Actually, the most challenging part were uh, coming up with all the designs within the theme park. So each ride has its own set of characters and its own kind of storyline. So there's a log flume ride with these like Viking gnome characters. And then there's, uh, you know, there's the uh, different mascots in the theme park. So uh, in, actually, in order to blend in, uh, Minky and his crew put on the mascot uniform. So Minky puts on the, the costume of King Corgi and he walks around looking like this royal Corgi around the park. And all the humans just think it's like a, a human in a mascot uniform. Tell us about Minky's crew. Well, he's <laughs> so they're kind of... Uh, they kind of roll their eyes every time they hear him, you know, bark orders. But, you know, they're, they're kind of like a dysfunctional family in a way. So he's got his science officer, Illy. She's definitely the, the brightest one. And she doesn't really want to conquer planets, but she kind of joins the crew in order to travel and study different planets. And then you have Egla. She's the security officer and she's very like by the book. She doesn't understand why. You know, Minky takes such risks and doesn't listen to her, like, you know, her security protocols. And then you have Neutsch. He's sort of the liaison officer, like taking notes, the communications officer. And then you have Vondo. Vondo's the most dog-like character. Almost if you think of, like, Pluto versus Goofy, like, he's the most, most dog-like. And he's the, the mechanic, so he helps fix the ship. That's quite a group of aliens. So... Yehudi, do you believe in aliens? The, the magical thinking side of me definitely wants to believe there are aliens. But whether they're coming down to Earth in these like UFOs and abducting people and taking over theme parks, that's, that's pure fantasy. What? Uh, uh, ah! uh, uh, well, I guess there are aliens up there. Say hi to Minky for me. Remember, until next time, read a book in any format.
Hi, my name is Cecilia Ruiz and I make books for kids. I am originally from Mexico, the southern neighboring country of the United States. The official language in Mexico is Spanish. This is the country where I grew up in and this is where the story I'm going to talk about today takes place. Today, I want to talk to you about one character in particular, Abuela, which means grandma in Spanish. She's one of the main characters in my book, A Gift from Abuela. Tell us about your character. This character is based on my grandmother. Her name was Italia. I created this book based on a story that happened to her during a very difficult time in Mexico. When I was about four years old, Mexico started going through a crisis. Most people had to work multiple jobs, longer hours, and couldn't afford hardly anything. A lot of shops and businesses closed. People were hungry and upset. Things were getting more and more expensive every day. For example, when I was four years old, a bottle of water cost one peso, which is like one dollar. By the time I was 14, that same bottle of water cost 1,000 pesos. That's when the government decided something needed to change. They removed three zeros from the currency and printed new money. The new money was called Nuevos Pesos and people had to turn in their old bills to exchange them for the new bills. After a transitional period in which both types of bills were being used, then the government stopped accepting the old bills and the Nuevos Pesos became the official money. Many years after all this happened, while cleaning my grandma's house, we discovered a hidden stash of money she had forgotten about. There were bags and bags of old bills she had been saving up that no longer had value. A useless treasure, we all thought. We did the math and it was a lot. She could have bought a car with that money. The idea of money losing its value and just becoming paper was fascinating to me. Also seeing the look of confusion in my grandma's face. She was not typically the kind of person to be forgetful when this happened and yet she just simply forgot about that. Realizing how our memories aren't perfect had a huge impact in my life. What made you want to become a creator of books? I made this book in memory of her and this event. I tried to imagine why she started saving money in the first place and what could have happened that made her forget. With this book, I also wanted to celebrate the beautiful special relationships between grandmothers and their grandchildren. My grandma and I were very close. She had many, many grandchildren, and she always welcomed us at her house. I loved sitting next to her at the dinner table. She would teach me songs in different languages, and they would all involve some sort of hand choreography. I actually grew up believing she knew Japanese because she sang a song she said she had learned in Japan. Years later, I realized that that was not Japanese at all, and she had been making up all the words. If you found a whale in your bathtub, what would you do? I would turn on the shower and hope it starts singing. Hi, I'm Rocco Stano, and welcome to Storymakers on Kid Lit TV. I have award-winning author and illustrator Duncan Tona Tiu. My full name is Duncan. Everyone in Spanish calls Duncan. me Duncan or Duncan yeah. Tona Tiu Smith Hernandez. And Tona Tiu is Nahuatl. It's the language that the Aztecs and people in the central region of Mexico spoke, and it means sun or god of the sun. Your artwork has been influenced by pre-Columbian art. You kind of have a signature ear. The ear that you're referring to, maybe you can see here. A kid told me it looks like the slice of a mushroom on a pizza. And my drawings are very stylized. And you'll see that the hands are also kind of unusual. You also notice in the book is that people are always in profile. We always see them looking to the side. 
never with both eyes straight at us. This is very much inspired by pre-Columbian art. Before the Europeans, before the Spanish came to this continent, they would draw in that style. And I decided that for my artwork, I would draw in a similar style. When I was in high school, I knew that I wanted to pursue a career in the arts. You know, I did a lot of painting, a lot of black and white photography, different writing classes. But as I spent more time in the U.S., I began to miss things that were around me in Mexico. The food, the music, different traditions. And I had the opportunity to, to make my first book, my first picture book, Dear Primo, which is about two cousins. It's not a biography, it's not my personal story, but it's very much inspired by my observations of growing up in Mexico. And so one of the cousins, Carlitos, he goes to the posadas that happen in December and plays football and plays with trompos, canicas, all the games, all the things that I did as a kid. But then his cousin, Charlie, he lives in the United States in a city and they send letters back and forth about their um, experiences. At least two of your books were recognized with, uh, by the Seibert Award, yes. which is for nonfiction. And, and this is one of them. Um, separate is never equal. And it's a story that many people don't know. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the issue. You know, some of the books that I make are fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I make up the characters, maybe inspired by things in real life, but the, but the characters are made up and some are nonfiction or informational. So this is a true story. The children, Silvia and her brothers, they couldn't go to school with uh, white children. They had to go to a separate school. And this was true, and this story takes place in California, and this was true in many parts of the Southwest of the United States. Their family and other Latino families, they didn't th think that that was fair, and they joined together and they filed a lawsuit. And eventually, California was the first state to desegregate schools. Kids connect to this story a lot because they see the injustice in the story and sometimes they see parallels to, to some of their own experiences. So this is one of the books recognized by the Cypher. And your other book is Funny Bones. It's about an artist named Jose Guadalupe Posada. A lot of people don't know his name, but mm -hmm. a lot of people know his calaveras, know mm -hmm. the artwork he made. He made these Day of the Dead skeletons that during the Day of the Dead, you see him everywhere. So I wanted to make that book to kind of recognize this artist, to learn more about him. I myself wanted to learn more about who he was and why he made those skeletons. I'm very happy with that book because I was able to incorporate a lot of his drawings with my drawings. One thing that I did with that book is that he was alive more than 100 years ago and he wasn't very famous during his lifetime. Even today, even now that his art is very famous, he himself, a lot of people don't know his name. So there's not that much information about him. Things that I couldn't find out about him, I asked questions of why he may, he may have drawn this skeleton, this calavera wearing this fancy hat or what may have inspired him to draw these skeletons dancing and eating. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you don't know, if you can't find the information, I thought, well, maybe I can ask, you know, what, what may have inspired, and, and that's a little bit about that book. And this is more for older kids. It's called Undocumented, A Worker's Fight. While I take it out of the slipcase, tell us a little bit about the book. I like books like Persepolis, like Mouse, these books that talk about events in history, like the Holocaust, the Iranian Revolution, and I wanted to do something similar, something that talked about politics, and I decided to make it about some of the people that I met here in New York. Some of them were undocumented. They didn't have the proper papers to be in the United States. And because of that, they were being exploited at their job. They worked in restaurants and in different places and they weren't being paid properly or the boss was stealing their tips or if someone got sick, they wouldn't help them out. And some of the people that I met uh, were Mixtec. And Mixtec is a group from the South of Mexico, an indigenous group, like a native group from Mexico. And I looked up Mixtec artwork and I saw that the mixtecs drew uh, the way that I was saying earlier with their ears kind of like that, like threes, uh, very flat, very stylized, almost kind of like the he Egyptian hieroglyphics. And they also made books that folded out like accordions like this, yeah, very well, long. Yeah, that's what I wanted to show. They actually made books like this. Yeah, they would draw them on the hides of animals or on paper made with tree bark and they were very long. And their books told their stories of their warriors, of their kings, of their gods. And most of these books were destroyed when, when the Spanish and other Europeans came to this continent. But some of those books survive. And I saw images from those books. And so when I was in school and college, I decided that I wanted to make a book in that style. That was one thing that was important for me is that when I published it, I wanted to make sure that it folded out like that. Yes. Before we talk about your upcoming book, another one of your books is The Princess and the Warrior. Is that based on a uh, legend? I wanted to do a book that was taking a story that people know of the sleeping woman, 
which is this volcano in Mexico. Mm -hmm. There's a legend about this volcano, about Iztaccíhuatl, the sleeping woman, and Popocatépetl, the smoky mountain. And it's a story a little bit like Romeo and Juliet that involves this warrior, uh, Popoca, and Iztaccíhuatl, Ista, someone tricks Ista, and she falls into this deep sleep that oh. she cannot wake up from. But the legend serves to explain why the volcanoes are shaped like that. Why this volcano, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a woman laying down covered in snow. So if we were to go to Mexico City, we would actually see these two mountains. Yeah, in different parts of Mexico City, you can see it. Oftentimes when you're landing into Mexico City, you can see it. So your upcoming book. Yes, the book is called Soldier for Equality, Jose de la Luz Science and the Great War. It's about a man named Jose de la Luz Sainz. His family had come from Mexico. His grandmother had come from Mexico, but he was born in Texas. He was a teacher. And then when the United States went to war during World War I, mm -hmm. he decided to join the army. He volunteered to be a part of the army. And he kept a diary. And every day he would write about his experiences during the war, all the things that he saw. But he also wrote about a lot the discrimination in the army and back in Texas towards people of, of Mexican origin. He became an activist and he started writing articles and, and talking about this. So the book is about him, about him growing up in Texas and the challenges he faced as a kid, then joining the army, and then coming back and seeing that things hadn't changed but not giving up and, and using that experience to fight for, for the rights of, of Latinos like him. Do you have any advice for kids about creativity? Kids that are interested in writing, my best advice would be to read a lot. I think if you read a lot, then you start seeing what other authors do in their books, you know, how they tell their stories, how they structure their stories, and then you can use some of the things that you see them do in your own writing. The more time and energy you spend doing something, the better it gets. If you dedicate a lot of time and energy to what you're doing, it's gonna definitely get better. Thank you so much for coming to KidLit TV to share some of your books. Thank you, Rocco. I appreciate it. So remember, until next time, read a book in any format.